Welcome and thank you all for joining us for this episode of the Crexy Podcast, an insider's look at all things commercial real estate. I'm your host, Ashley Kopovich, Regional Director at Crexy, and today we are thrilled to sit down with our very special guest, Fernando De Leon, CEO of Leon Capital and Crexy's first investor and evangelist. Before we dive in, a little bit about our guest. Fernando De Leon is the founder and CEO of Leon Capital Group, a holding company that owns $10 billion of assets in healthcare, real estate, and technology. Mr. De Leon is the sole general partner of over 300 partnerships and subsidiaries across the Leon Capital Group of companies. For 15 years, Leon has been a leader in the real estate development industry, beginning as a modest, privately owned company and transitioning into a diverse holding company capable of operating successfully across various geographies and various industries. In the real estate sector, Leon Capital Group owns and develops multifamily apartments, healthcare facilities, and industrial and logistics warehouses. Its current portfolio includes 12,000 apartments and 10 million square feet of commercial real estate in various markets across the southwestern and southeastern U.S. Additionally, Leon Capital, along with the Perot Companies, co-founded a European industrial company, which currently controls over $3 billion in industrial assets in the EU. Mr. De Leon also founded Specialty Dental Brands, Physician-Directed Partners, Turnwell Medical Health, Mental Health Partnership, and Advanced Med Aesthetic Partners. Mr. De Leon began his career as an analyst at Goldman Sachs in New York. He received a Bachelor of Arts degree cum laude from Harvard College, where he was a Hoover Foundation Scholar and a National Coca-Cola Scholar. The De Leon Family Foundation focuses its work on educational initiatives in Texas and poverty in northern Mexico. The De De Leon Scholars Program makes scholarship awards to 20 students annually across the state of Texas who endeavor to improve their communities. Fernando, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley. Of course, of course. I don't know where you found it, but it's... (laughs) It's uh, it'll it'll do for now. <laughs> it is very extensive. We are so happy to have you. You're an extremely impressive person. So thanks so much for sitting down and chatting with us today. I'm sure our listeners are so excited to get into the nitty gritty and learn a great deal from you. Thanks so much for joining. Yeah, thanks for having me. Of course. Well, before we dive into today's main topic, I'd like to know more about your journey and how you got into this industry. So what led you to the commercial real estate industry and particularly in investing? I, I mean, I think in, in real estate, um, I had done a little bit of work um, in a prior life before I started Leon Capital Group in, in real estate. But frankly, you know, if I kind of am completely candid, I think it was um, a low barrier to entry industry. I didn't have any capital. Um, I didn't have uh, any unique skill sets. And so there was a low barrier to entry to start um, uh, to start the real estate industry. So um, when I had started when I was kind of 25, 26 and, and done a, a series of one-off deals and, um, and kind of the foundational part of, the, of my career was 2008 um, that dislocated all the capital markets and the real estate markets and presented kind of a once in a lifetime opportunity. Um, so I, we did a lot, uh, 2009, 10, 11, 12, those were very formative years where we, um, did everything that we could, uh, find. So, you know, we were buying loans and working them out with, uh, with banks. Um, we were buying whole loans, portfolios of loans. We were buying broken deals. Um, there was a lot of trouble um, throughout the entire industry. And, and so it was kind of a unique uh, time to begin the On Capital Group. And, and so in earnest, it started in 2009. And it's been, uh, well, t- 2007 really, but, but most of the transactions that we did were kind of 2009, 10, and 11. Um, and they were, it was just a very unique time to, to get into the industry as a principal and to 
um, to put together capital to to go do deals. But um, that it, it was really timing is is what we benefited from. Absolutely. I feel like in, you know, certain economic downturns for sure, you know, if you, if you have the advantage to be able to get into there, you know, it's just like kind of where we are now, a lot of people are benefiting. So kind of take advantage of that timing if you can. And and that's really interesting that that's how you guys sort of catapulted into everything. What key principles, Fernando, um, has driven or motivated some of your career decisions? I would say that probably what I, you know, I started Leon Capital Group when I was 28, 29 years old. Um, and so what I really thought about was um, was having a 60-year investing career, right? I wanted to look back at some point and say, when I'm 90 years old, um, what did we build over these next 60 years old, 60 years? And, and it had to be able to kind of stand the test of time. So every decision we made wasn't about, wasn't about oh, hey, let's maximize this or maximize that profit. It was, what is this going to look like um, uh, 20, 30, 50, 60 years from now? And, and, um, and I knew that kind of real estate was going to be uh, the initial entry point for us, but that at some point um, the company, the, the the holding company would would own assets in multiple different industries. Um, it's interesting. Today, I was having a conversation with an employee that worked with me, um, you know, ten years ago, and and then ultimately went off on his own. and And he was reminding me that that uh, that when he started, um, it was a hundred percent real estate, and and he said that his prediction had been back then that in twenty years, um, real estate would probably be. Um, less than half of our exposure, and and so today it is. Um, so probably half of our assets are real estate, and half of them are non-real estate assets. Um, and uh, and so I think you know, to me, it was durability. It was about having kind of a 50, 60 year time frame where we could do good work and and be um, and have staying power and and be diverse um, in our in the assets that we built. So that was probably the most important principle from the beginning. I love that. A lot of times we get so focused in the here and now and and what can I do right now to get that quick win? But I love looking at the big picture and looking, you know, forward thinking in that 50, 60 year type of frame. So I like that you're putting that front and center and just a reminder for all of our audience here today. Um, What were some lessons, Fernando, that you learned early on that you prepared that prepared you for commercial real estate in this industry specifically, first question, and then second, any additional lessons that you learned early on for just entrepreneurship, life, and in general. So take the first one from commercial real estate, and then we'd also like to see it from more of a life and entrepreneurship also. Well, I mean, beyond real estate, building a business is, I've heard it being described in the past as um, chewing glass and staring into the abyss. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a really, really lonely, um, experience. Nobody knows what it feels. Um, often you feel like, and it's true that nobody cares. Um, and so you're there and you're trying to do it and you're trying to invent something out of nothing. Um, so lessons for entrepreneurship is, um, toughness um, and and being able to withstand body blows. Um, everybody wants to have you know business plans and tightly you know uh, tightly dis- designed uh, pro formas and models and all of that's all of that stuff goes out the window when when you have um, things that happen and and the things that happen in business are a broad range of variables from. You know, people that take advantage of you or steal or cheat or lie or all of the many things that happen inevitably in building a business. Um, so you have to have you have to have the stomach for it. And um, and, and, you know, there's just no there's no way around that. You can you have to be able to withstand uh, changes that happen every minute. And so if you if you're not comfortable in an environment that changes every 60 seconds, go go do something else because building a business is is going to require your full 
um, anxiety and your full intellect um, every second of the day. So I think it's 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 toughness, um, it's grittiness, and it's the ability to withstand constant change and um, and unexpected problems. So that you know, on, on the broader business building side, on a personal level, I'd say you know enjoy the ride because people, the people that you collect along the way. Um, you, you know, one of the, one of the things I learned was you never know what bad or good thing led to the next one. Um, so if you kind of, um, if I look at, if I look back at a, a bad deal that I did, and then I look at the unintended consequences or the connection points that happened from that bad deal to somebody I met as a result of it, um, it would have been, you know, I would have missed out if I hadn't been in that position. And even though I'd lost money on a deal or something, I met somebody that led us to um, to a different opportunity. And it's always like that. So if you you know if you kind of whine about the about the issues and about the bad breaks, you're not you know you're not of of strong mind to see what's around the corner and and look at opportunity that comes from it. And there's always opportunity. You just have to you know, be, be looking for it. So I would say that, you know, philosophically at a personal level, um, you, you have things that don't go right, don't go well. And then you find opportunity in, in that chaos or in that, uh, disappointment. And, and usually it all goes back to people. So if you treat people right, if you're a reasonable, logical human being, people will come back to you and, and, and find opportunity. And so, um, I would say that I could trace back every every one of the greatest successes that we've had. I could trace it back to a moment where it was originated by a bad disappointment. Every one of them, I mean, including Crexy. I met I met Mike DiGiorgio um, buying an, uh, a real estate asset um, that was ultimately a very bad investment. The real estate uh, uh, shopping center was a pretty bad investment, um, but in that shopping center. Um, we, uh, we met, uh, made an investment in Crexy, and then ultimately we, we, uh, we leased, uh, space to a company, a dental business in that shopping center, um, that we, we today still own. And that dental business, you know, is, um, is the largest specialty dental business in the country today, seven years later. And it came as a result of that bad investment in a real estate deal. Um, so, you know, nobody knows how this stuff plays out. And I think you have to have general optimism. You have to have, you know, sort of a, um, a flair for having fun with it because you don't know what's around the corner. Oh, I love all of that and love that insight story, um, obviously, with your relationship with Mike. Um, has been a long one, being one of Crexy's earliest investors. So thanks for sharing that story. Um, but I, I completely resonate, and I'm sure our listeners have as well. I mean, you know, from an entrepreneurship in general, um, I personally don't have kids, but a lot of our listeners might. It's it's kind of like your baby, right? And you have to just roll with the punches. And, and sometimes it's hard days. Sometimes it's great days. But as you said, just have that optimism, have fun. Um, I always love to say to, to my sales teams as well is, is resilience is everything, right? And always take something from, you know, as you said, maybe a bad deal or a bad investment or a bad call, a bad pitch. If you learn something, if you're treating the customer correctly, as you said, treat people right, you're going to come out on top. So just approach that life, approach entrepreneurship with that, that you know, optimism um, and, you know, kind of let that be your guide and have the resilience to overcome the downfalls. So appreciate you sharing that. I absolutely resonate with it. <laughs> Some days are tougher than others, but you know, if, if you have that that glass half full, you'll you'll always be winning, I think. Um, so early on in your in your career or you know, middle of your career, even now, um, talk to us about some of your mentors and and how they helped guide you on your path. Well, it's interesting. I've always gravitated to people that are I probably have a couple of characteristics. Um, one is people that are self-made, so they made something of themselves without, um, 
you know, without inheriting it or without, um, you know, receiving some kind of advantage. Um, so those are, you know, I, I usually gravitate um, culturally and philosophically to, to people like that. And then second of all, um, I do gravitate and I have a bias towards people that, that build things, that make, um, that, that kind of put their imprint on, on, um, on the world. And sometimes that's technology like Craigsy. Sometimes um, it's a chicken restaurant. Uh, sometimes it's a, um, a, a large healthcare company. Sometimes it's a, um, an ophthalmologist that owns, um, you know, nine ophthalmology clinics in Atlanta and has built a remarkable practice with, uh, multiple physicians, or sometimes it's, um, you know, a, a landscaping company that happens to, uh, have, you know, a dozen crews working landscaping in, in East LA or in, you know, in the San Fernando Valley. And it's a, it's, it's, it's started by a, by a businessman who immigrated from Central America and came to the United States and built something. Um, and so, you know, from, so those are the people that I really kind of recognize and I, I hold as, as prototypes or mentors. Um, I don't usually have a lot in common with um, the fund managers and the finance uh, folks that are kind of, you know, using other people's money and, and, and managing third party capital have very little skin in the game. And, and, uh, and that's a very different business, right? That's a, that's a essentially a banking investment, ban investment management business. And, and so I tend to have um, a great deal of, of uh, admiration, respect for people that build consequential businesses that really create employment and that have um, a discernible impact in their, in their communities. And, and those are the kinds of people that I'm kind of naturally uh, drawn to. Uh, there's a lot of people. Um, there's a gentleman who, uh, who, when I was getting started, um, he since has passed. Um, he, he started a chain of um, universities in Latin America. Um, and he was one of my first investors, one of the first uh, people that, that believed in me. And uh, he built a monumental business, um, probably a you know, three, four billion dollar business that he owned 100 percent of. He had started as a as a teacher, um, had students and then gradually built it into a for profit education system. And there's probably several million people that have gone through those universities and improved their lot in life, thanks to, to this gentleman, um, Ignacio Guerra. Um, and, but he was one of my first investors, and and uh, you know he, a person like that. I remember you know being 27, 28 years old, and sitting around and saying, um, you know, we should do this. And he would say, and he was you know probably 85 at the time, and I was 28, and he would say to me no, you need to do that. And then 10 times more than that. So he was like, you know, constantly pushing. Uh, I thought I was being ambitious and I thought I was being um, kind of young and impressionable. And he, and he, you know, kind of one up me on, on, on being more ambitious, you know, at his ripe age of 85. So, you know, he had a zest for, for building businesses and finding entrepreneurs. And, um, and I want to believe that that's kind of why he, he, he invested with me early on. And I kind of, I want to believe that that's why I invested in Mike DiGiorgio early on, right? Kind of a, a tough, uh, scrappy um, guy like Mike who wanted to build something. And so there's sort of a domino effect of people that believe in each other based on on grit and and toughness and and wanting to build something out of nothing. So um, it's kind of the the cycle, I think. You know, one one thing leads to another, and 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 that gentleman in particular kind of set in motion. A pretty good uh, domino effect that that even today we see we we invest in a lot of different businesses and some of my you know kind of attracting business leaders comes from those initial um, things that I learned from 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 him. Absolutely, I love to hear that, and then I love to hear that even still, you know, as you're as you're getting older, you don't have to lose that grit and that hungriness, and you know, you can just give a direct answer, and that's what a lot of people are missing these days. So I love that you were able to get that early on, and then transition that and kind of pay it forward into the people that you then trickled down to and in, in starting investing and in started to invest in. 
Um, speaking of that and kind of going more on to the topic of your company, so focusing back onto the present, can you tell us more about what your company does? So how did your holding company come to be and what kind of player is Leon Capital in the real estate industry? So the holding company, Leon Capital Group, um, basically holds two types of assets. It holds um, real estate companies and non-real estate companies. Um, the real estate uh, companies in Leon Capital Group, there's a an apartment business that builds, primarily builds apartments. Uh, we buy land and title it, uh, develop it in six markets, in Raleigh, uh, Tampa, Orlando, Dallas, Austin, um, and Phoenix. And those markets, we, we buy land and title it, permit it, design projects, um, construct them, lease them, operate them, and sometimes sell them. Um, so that's a pretty basic business. We build um, probably 3,000 apartments a year um, across those markets. And, and then um, some years have been more, some years have been less. Um, I think right now in the pipeline, there's probably you know six to 7,000 apartments that we're building in those six markets. Um, <clears throat> we do the same thing in the uh, uh, logistics and uh, warehouse distribution business. So we buy land, we build warehouses, and, um, and we also buy um, some uh, uh, kind of value add uh, uh, warehouse product in, in these markets. Um, some of those are kind of infill logistics business, I mean, uh, assets, and we, we accumulate those assets, cash flow them, hold them. Sometimes we'll sell them, but for the most part, we hold those assets. Um, and then we have a, um, a separate investment in Europe where we um, are co co managers with a, a large um, group, and we develop warehouses there as well in, in the UK, Poland, and Germany. And uh, and that's a business that we've been uh, in since since also since 2010. So it's going on 12 years now, and and it was. It was acquired at the bottom of the cycle in 2010. Uh, if you'll recall, Europe was a few years behind the United States. So, so Greece and Spain and all of those issues in Southern Europe were plaguing the European economy. And so 2010 and 11 were really good years for us to come in and, and make bets in, in European logistics. Um, <clears throat> and so that's the real estate business. And then it has some other assets. Uh, we own healthcare assets, real estate healthcare assets. Um, we make investments alongside other developers. Um, we'll back developers when they want to start a new develop a real estate company. So sometimes folks that are starting a new real estate company will support them with capital um, so they can go and, and, and do deals. Um, so we do what we call GP investing in real estate as well. Um, and so, you know, that's that, that was the, the way I got started in business. And that continues to be probably half of what we do today. The other half is um, is primarily focused on uh, building and operating companies not related to real estate, and those are in um, anything from you know a, a chain of salon suites that we own um, that is called Madison Avenue, all the way to the dental business that I mentioned earlier, which is the largest dental uh, specialty dental business in the country. Um, and it ha has 320 clinics around the country, 4,000 employees, and we manage that um, uh, alongside a management team that, that works with us. And, uh, and so we have um, nine different companies that look like that, dental, salon suites, ophthalmology. Um, and then in addition to that, we have a small um, kind of practice where we make passive investments like, like Crexy, and like uh, a lot of other companies, um, some in technology, some in outside of technology, but we we um, we also you know back entrepreneurs and some and in in those cases we're minority investors and we're relatively passive. But the the big nine um, operating companies, those we are you know day to day managing them and and making sure that they're running well. So um, some of those are here in Dallas with me, and others are in other parts of the country. 
That is awesome. Fernando, I don't know about our listeners, but I am exhausted just hearing that. No, I'm just I'm just kidding. But <laughs> it's awesome. Is there anything that you don't do? It, it's it's truly amazing everything that you cover and, and starting this from the ground up. So um, how did you build your portfolio and what do you look for in investments or in, t- in terms of business collaborators? Well, on the first question of how did we build it, we built it uh, with a lot, a lot of blood, sweat, and tears. Um, I say, you know, we um, when we were growing, we would take capital from you know a deal that that we made some money on. Let's say we 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 built an apartment complex, we sold it, we made cap, we made profits. We used those to fund a dental business or a veterinary business, um, and then sometimes the veterinary business would generate cash flow and we would use that to fund real estate businesses, uh, real estate development assets. Um, and so all, all of these work in synchrony and that's how we, how we built it. Um, we don't, we don't run a fund and we don't use a lot of third party capital. Um, so all of this was, was our capital and it, it took a lot of, um, a lot of, you know, conviction to, to take money out of something we knew and then diversify into a, a new kind of business. Um, not unlike when we said, hey, we are you know, we're, uh, industrial developers, but we're going to invest in, in the future of real estate, which is going to be much more digital and much more like Crexy. So we took our kind of understanding of, of brick and mortar real estate and we said, but but the future is probably going to look a little bit differently. So you have to have some conviction about about diversifying away from something you knew into something that that you knew less about, but that you had um, sort of a um, an ideological um, belief that things would go in that direction. So so we created these you know kind of large investment themes around housing, around e commerce, around digital adoption, around healthcare. Um, those are pretty basic things, right? So everything that I did was, you know, if we're doing LASIK and cataract surgery in our ophthalmology clinics, I felt like that the demographics of people getting older um, in America um, would require those services, or um, or we felt like you know uh, pet. Uh, ownership was going to increase, so we bet in the veterinary industry, or we felt like digital adoption would take more of the real estate sector, and therefore we invested in Crexy. So these were, you know, they were bets. I mean, we just believed that things would go in a certain direction. That's how the portfolio was built. Um, but I, I stress the fact that because it's not a fund, anytime we had a win, we had to go do something that we believed in, and. I think you know, in 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 contrast to say the fund world, where fund managers will take capital and then you know um, sell an asset, never own it again, and then uh, distribute that capital. There's no long term ownership there. Um, there just isn't because those funds have finite lives, um, so they don't have to live with those assets. Whereas when we own them directly with our capital. These were things that we really had to feel really, really strongly about because we would own them uh, in perpetuity. Sure, absolutely, and I, I love that you bring up that point because that's a that's a next question. Um, so making your decisions, you all want to have that conviction, and you know it is a bet, but you want to make sure that this is you know what you guys are looking forward towards the future and what you really think with you know without doubt or with with a little bit of doubt that is going to happen. So can you tell our listeners what? Are the investment principles that sort of guide you and your companies, um, and you know how have they maybe adapted or changed or stayed the same in the current market? Yeah, I mean the the, the principles don't change based on market conditions. We 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 have to think about things that are durable, um, that are going to stand the test of time. Um, for instance, today, like I mentioned, ophthalmology um, is a business that we feel there's 10,000 people turning 65 every day in the United States. There's there's a, a scarcity of of, um, of eye care services, and we believe strongly that we can support that business. 
Um, the housing business, for instance, um, in, in the markets we're in, like Dallas and Austin, we feel like those markets will grow disproportionately uh, well relative to, say, coastal markets. And we believe in, in building um, relatively attainable housing in those markets. So, so the principles are durability. They have to be, we're investing in companies that do things that are essential. So um, it has to be things that people really, really need, like housing and eye care services or uh, things like that. Um, <clears throat> the other thing is, because we're a private company and we can look at you know 20 and 30 year ownership timeframes, we are also able to hire and recruit talent, um, the kinds of people that are not looking to kind of come in and out of something, but want to build long-term wealth. Um, so we can reward and compensate people very, very well and very healthily relative to um, kind of transient platforms. Um, we can we can afford to, to compensate people very, very well because we're looking at at you know multi-decade investments. Um, so the people that help us do those things, we can be very, very generous with. So I'd say the principles are hiring really extraordinary people and being very, very generous with them um, as upside participants and owning parts of the business, um, the durability over the long haul, and then doing uh, making investments in things that are not going to get kind of disrupted easily um, and that are really, really essential for, for human life. Absolutely. I, I completely agree. And, and kind of coming back to the same topics that we talked about, you know, looking big picture, what is going to be needed for the future, not just now, you know, what is long term sustainability? And then also coming back to those people, right? Treat people right, invest in the in, in the right people and bring them on board. So I love to hear that. Thanks for sharing. Um, switching into um, a different topic, let's zoom out a little bit. So with the year dying, winding down, um, everyone's looking to 2023 predictions. So from a macro perspective, what trends and patterns do you foresee at the top of 2023, given the current events? Well, this is where I'm going to put my not too optimistic hat on. Um, <laughs> but uh, but like, I, I'll, I'll, preface it, I'll, I'll preface it by saying this. Um, in the short term, nothing really matters that much. There's a lot of arm waving and a lot of, you know, flailing um, that happens in the short term. Um, there are short term cost of capital movements. Uh, there are things that happen in the short term, like, you know, flushing out um, certain elements of crypto and NFTs and certain parts of the economy at the margins that weren't very uh, accretive or very value producing. Um, so I think economies, industrialized economies generally flush those things out at the margins. I think we're seeing some of that. So um, so I think in the short term, you have a lot of movement in volatility in the public markets. You have things at the margins that aren't value producing that get kicked out. You have a cost of capital adjustment that goes up, in my prediction, um, over the next 18 to 24 months and then gradually stabilizes. Um, I think, you know, that the long end of the curve is probably closer to a two and a half to three percent 10 year treasury. And I think in that environment, you know, we can transact a lot of business. But in the interim, I think there's a little bit of pain and I think there's some um, expectations that need to be moderated. Um, the economic engine is a lot about psychology and market sentiment. And a lot of it is um, compared to expectations and expectations were high. So we need to get rid of, you know, we need to kind of moderate those expectations. So there's um, visibility. And, and I think that's what happens over the next year or so. So it's a pretty cloudy uh, environment. And I think, you know, business people I, and like me and, and, and others, um, I think we're generally defensive going into 2023. For, for the right reason. Um, so I think, you know, people's expectations of what they deserve also need to moderate a little bit. Um, that's a cultural question uh, to a large extent. So, so I think we, um, we're going to have a pretty, 
uh, cloudy 2023 where things are going to be uh, shifting around. And I think capital investors and people that make business decisions need to be generally defensive. Got it. I to- totally agree. Um, what are your thoughts on where we're going in terms of the rising cost of capital and how are investors or sellers adjusting their strategies or portfolios? Yeah, I mean, I think cost of capital is pretty pretty murky for the next couple of years. Um, probably, you know, call it one to two years. I don't see it going past that, but I do think that we're resetting what the price of money is. Some of that, um, I mean, it's, it's clear that that you know you cannot get away with printing, uh, you know, three to five trillion dollars worth of stimulus and not altering the value of anything, right? If you if you create um, you know, $3 trillion of anything. I don't care if it's rocks or land or anything. If you create $3 trillion of anything, it's going to distort the value of it. So we've, we've, um, we've, we're in price discovery what, for what money costs. Um, hell, we were in price discovery for what money is until about three weeks ago, right? We, we were thinking that some kid in the Bahamas, you know, playing, uh, plain entrepreneur was inventing money and people believe that nonsense. So um, so for a while we were like still trying to figure out what money was. Um, now we've gotten past that and I think that's just where the dumb money is. And now we're moving to what's money valued at and what's it worth. Um, so we're, we're in a point where we're trying to discover uh, that. And I think some of that is international related. Some of it's geopolitical related. Some of it is um, obviously inflation related, but but there's certainly a, too many variables to count um, geopolitically and, and in terms of visibility um, to figure out what the cost of money is in the next 12 months. And so I think the markets will decide that. I do think, again, the long end of the curve is already pricing in about a 3% 10-year treasury, which I think is is kind of where it should be. And, and I think we can live with that. Um, but you know the we we uh, we issued I think over the over the last three weeks about 120 billion dollars worth of debt uh, per week every every one of the last three weeks and so we are pr- uh, pr- we are producing um, U.S. dollar denominated debt and and so the cost of our borrowing will will track that and and that's why I think you know our 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 our, uh, our treasury cost, our treasury yield is so high because the market is pricing in um, more less quantitative easing and more uh, debt production, um, and those are all things that we have to watch. I mean, politics do matter and they impact the cost of capital uh, dramatically. So um, there's a, about a year or two of price discovery for the cost of money, but at least we're not still trying to debate what money is. <laughs> Sure, absolutely. I, I I agree there. So within those market changes, where do you think are some hidden opportunities or maybe misunderstood potential, either either in different asset classes or markets, et cetera? Um, and then how can investors today take advantage of them to buffer against headwinds? That's a tough one. Um, I would say, you know, in terms of market opportunities. You know, I, I recall um, in 2008, we used to call them uh, trophies and train wrecks, um, the types of opportunities that were out there, right? And so trophies were really, really great assets, um, but that they were kind of unmoved by by what was happening in 2008. So you had a very fundamentally sound asset. It, it didn't change its value very much. Um, it, it may, it, it, it could have moved its value based on who owned it and whether they had liquidity issues and needed to sell it to go solve another problem. But the trophies, they just didn't have a lot of price diminution. The train wrecks, um, they had a lot of price uh, diminution, but they but nobody wanted them. They were too difficult to solve. They needed so much capital. They should have never been built or, or done in the first place. So real estate assets, um, you know, if we get into a you know a couple of year blip where where we where we see trophies and train wrecks, there may be very little opportunity. 
um, to, to, to jump into. Um, you would ask yourself why, if the fundamentals are reasonably good for, say, industrial assets, why would you have to sell right now? And so I think a lot of sellers that are, you know, they, they won't make the decision to sell good assets in a time like this. So I think volume decreases, but but uh, but it, it, it's hard to pinpoint where the opportunity is. Most of it, I I suspect, comes from um, sponsorship that uh, owners that just have to sell for for a number of reasons, and that creates opportunity and and people that move fast and that have capital um, can take advantage of that. So I think sure. you know, for investors, I would just say you know keep your eyes out for for things that can be. Um, solved or restructured and that you could jump in fast. And I think that's generally where opportunities reside. Sure, sure. Absolutely. Now, from the opportunity perspective, let's take the flip side. What are the most pressing issues you would say that investors or sellers need to consider in the current market? And then what is just fluff? The, the most important things that, uh, I mean, I think you know, it depends on what real estate um, sub asset class, right? I mean, I think if you're owning office right now, um, you're you're going to have to do a lot of accommodations to to lure tenants in. Um, you're going to have to be well located and and have um, the ability to to bring in uh, tenants. Um, I think you probably have less headwinds in industrial. Um, you have a lot of near shoring in that business where the supply chains were really disrupted during COVID and beyond. And then some of that is coming back um, to, to reload um, in, in, uh, in the United States. So I think there's, a, there's demand that comes from e-commerce and from that in industrial. Um, I think housing, uh, rental housing benefits from high mortgage rates, um, making home ownership more expensive. And so rental housing uh, benefits from that. And so so I think every sub-asset class is going to have kind of a different set of variables, uh, but the fundamentals of, of, um, of demand and, um, you know, being in markets that are protected without too much supply, I think that's what investors, you know, needed to watch before and that's what they need to watch today. Um, but I think, you know, you're going to have, you, you need a moment of, there is going to be some pain and we all are going to have to take some tolerance for pain. Uh, but I think, you know, the most important thing is patience. Um, you you got to find the right entry point. And if you're not patient, you, you know, this is kind of a moment where you make a lot of mistakes. If I look back, our best deals were not in 2008 or nine, they were really like 2010. Um, those are the best moments to invest. So you got to kind of wait for some of that pain to trickle through the economy. Um, and it's kind of, pretty predictable that way. Um, it, cycles happen where the weakest parts of those um, <clears throat> of those sectors kind of have pain and and that presents investment opportunities for, for well-capitalized investors. So I think those fundamentals kind of stand before, you know, in good times and in bad times. Sure. And, and that's a principle to keep back to, right? Patience is a virtue. My mom always used to say that, right? <laughs> so just bring that back. That, that's a good memory. Um, you know, and kind of history is repeating itself. So kind of take a pause and, and kind of see where it goes. So thanks for that reminder. Um, switching into the, the broker role here for some of our listeners, how is the broker's role significant or changing in today's commercial real estate market? So maybe using new tools or being a mediator in a widening bid ask gap, you know, things of that nature. Talk to us a little bit from the broker perspective. Yeah, sure. I, I, look, I think um, these are these are the times where brokers matter uh, the most, and I think the ones the brokers that avail themselves of good data and good technology um, are able to give us uh, the most amount of value and owners of property and, and market makers, they need, this is when we need brokers uh, to step up the most. So I think this is unique times where, like you said, the, the bid ask gap is widest. Um, so there's a lot of skill um, that comes into, into play right now. It's interesting that, you know, in normal markets, um, in normal markets, 
you know, all of us are a little bit more kind of going with the momentum of things. Uh, but in difficult markets, what we do matters a lot more um, because we can create some greater distinction relative to the competition. So this is when when brokers can really service their clients, do the best, create the most value for them. Uh, but some of it is being clever about technology and about gathering data and about having the best um, way to reach um, customers, whether those are tenants or buyers. Um, you know, having that outreach in in, in platforms, uh, digital platforms that allows you to disseminate information. I think this is when it comes in in handy the most, and this is when um, having the ability to do that pays the most. Um, so I think um, you know, for those of for those listeners and brokers that have not been in the business that long, or this is their first kind of market dip or cycle change. Um, you should take some solace in the fact that this is a really good opportunity, right? Uh, you know, the, these are the moments where you kind of um, prove your metal and prove your resilience and capacity, and you can differentiate yourself from the competition. So, um, you know, people should see this as an opportunity, uh, not really a, uh, be be afraid of it. So, um, so I'd say, you know, today the the mark the brokers over the next 24 months can can really really prove themselves I love that, Fernando. And again, back to the mindset that you've shared with us throughout the whole episode is looking at challenges as opportunities, right? You mentioned it before, um, but using all of the data, right? Knowledge is power. So get out there, make sure that you're using all of the technologies at your fingertips, arming yourself and, and being better than the competition. Make yourself stand out and do the work and then they will be rewarded for you over the next 12, 24 months. So thanks for that advice to our brokers um, who are listening in. Now, fourth topic, um, to tap your brain, we have some rapid fire questions and words of advice. Are you ready? Right. <laughs> All right. Don't be nervous. <laughs> okay. So first one, <laughs> if we were to give you um, $10 million today and you had to invest it immediately, what would your go-to asset type and location be and why? Um, I'd invest in the mental health, health mental health business, um, and I would invest in it pretty much anywhere in the country. But um, we are currently doing that, and I think that's the best investment thesis. The number of uh, mental health practitioners relative to uh, the need for mental health services is um, is probably thirty to one uh, in terms of demand to supply. And I think I would. Put that ten million dollars there. I think. I think you were referring specifically to real estate, um, and uh, it's a and good in real estate, I, I, <laughs> in in real estate, though, um, I would, you know, I'm partial to the to the housing to the rental housing business. Um, I would do it in uh, the suburban markets of um, Dallas, Austin, Phoenix. The markets we're in, <laughs> so um, Dallas, Austin, Phoenix, Denver. We're not in Denver, uh, but I think Denver continues to be a, a tremendous housing market, and um, and so we would. Uh, I, that's where I would put it in in real estate, and it wouldn't necessarily be development. I think there may be some opportunities to buy um, right now um, at you know slightly diminished prices, and and then wait for that to to improve over time. So those are the I'd say rental housing in. Austin, Dallas, and Denver. I love both of those answers and both su sustainable as well. Um, you know, the rise of mental health and making that such an importance in people's day-to-day -day lives has just taken off, I think, you know, just over the years, but especially since the pandemic. So I absolutely agree that's in such demand and, you know, we'll continue to, to be there. So that's awesome. And then people always need a place to live, right? Especially when people aren't, you know, getting the housing and, and buying the houses themselves, they're definitely going to need that rental. So um, great, great strategies on both ends. Um, second question, and I promise we, we're not setting you up here, um, but favorite tool or software that you use on the job? <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll uh, give you two answers. First is I think our team um, really, really benefits from um, 
from Crexy um, as a platform. I think we use it a lot in, in our real estate businesses. Um, part of it is because um, it's a very user-friendly set of products. But I also think, um, <laughs> and this is me being a little petty, but, but, uh, but there's a certain competitor out there that is just not very user-friendly. Um, and so I think, uh, <laughs> I think we, we are good. Crexy is a good product, but it just, some of it is because um, the, the competitive market for other tools is just relatively limited. So um, I still think we have a lot of work to do at Crexy, but I do think it is um, a number of superior products uh, that support the real estate industry for leasing and for, for, um, uh, for exposure to assets in general. Um, but I would tell you my, my favorite tool um, for investments is actually um, not technology. It's actually um, engaging with young people. Um, so I, I, I talk to my, uh, I have four children. I talk to them a lot about kind of how they view the future. Um, I, I've, uh, begun to guest lecture at a university, um, in, in entrepreneurship. And I talk to students, college students, uh, about kind of how they want the world to be and what they, what they think is the, um, the, the direction that we ought to go in, in terms of as consumers, as people, as uh, people living in society and the things that they need. So I would tell you my favorite tool to use is just constantly talking to young people because, you know, as you get older, you kind of, you got to kind of get set in your ways and you think you're right about everything. And, and usually, um, usually you're not, and things are changing before your, you know, your very eyes, but you're not acknowledging the change. Um, and so I try to think about, you know, what other people, young people, especially how they view the world. And that's my favorite tool to tap into. I love that. Obviously the Crexy plug, but also just getting out there and learning from people. Um, being in sales is always the phrase, always be closing, but I love always be learning, not just in sales and work aspects, but also in life. I mean, hearing other people's perspectives that's different than your own, constantly growing and having you know that growth mindset and exploring other ways. That's how we constantly come up with new ideas or build new things, right? Especially talking to the younger generations because, you know, know, um, there's that song, children are our future. You know, I think that's one of the lines, but you know, it, it, it's really what is going to be the next generation and how are we going to take them there? So that's awesome. I love that you're doing that and guest lecturing. I'm sure everyone in class is, is, um, amazed to, to hear you speak. So thanks for doing that. Um, and third final rapid fire question for you. What is the most common misconception about what you do or the industry you work in? That's a great question. Um, you know, I'm going to get a little controversial here for a second. I, I think a, a very common misconception is that um, private equity companies make money. Um, I think it's it's interesting that the, the um, private equity industry, whether it's in real estate or in non-real estate assets, um, they, they really, you know, the the top ten percent of private equity fund managers make about a seventeen percent return, um, and and the, those funds generally only have a twenty percent carried interest above a preferred return. So they're really generating, you know, two or three points um, on on their assets plus fees, and so it's a very very small amount of profits generated by by private equity. And, and generally, I think you see that because now you have private equity managers that are publicly traded um, and the public markets, you know, don't really pay uh, great multiples for fund managers for private equity companies. So if you look at the Apollos and KKRs of the world, um, they trade at kind of 10, 11, 12 times earnings um, and they're relatively small companies. So, you know, Carlyle's the third largest um Third largest, third largest private equity manager in the world. They manage six, 550 to $600 billion of assets. And they're about uh, 5% the size of Starbucks. So, um, so Starbucks is 20 times larger. 
Sure, that's that's definitely a good one. So thanks for sharing. Um, as someone who has amassed such a large portfolio, Fernando, what advice would you give to newcomers or developing professionals within commercial real estate? I think I'd go back to the to to the um, idea um, that you never know what's around the corner. I'd say in, a, in any industry, real estate or not, um, you know, the people that you're around, every human being has potential and an opportunity. And so one thing leads to another and how you conduct yourself around people. I mean, how, how why would you give up that option of, of, of tapping into uh, opportunity, right? If every human being has an opportunity that they can come across, why wouldn't you want to be related to that person that can bring that to you um, as an opportunity? And so, um, so I tend to think that you know, keep your options open by being being reasonable with people and being um, attractive as a as a partner as a as a business um, alliance. Um, I think in everything we do, I think if you kept your options open, I think you you'd be better off than if you were you know, difficult to work with and <laughs> nobody wanted to deal with you. So, um, so I think, I tend to think that, that, you know, keeping an eye out for what's around the corner is a very, very good way to, to be an investor and to be a business person. Awesome. I couldn't agree more. Build that personal brand. You never know what everything, anything is going to come to. Always look at it as a, as a, as an opportunity. So appreciate all of the words of wisdom and sharing everything with our audience. Thank you so much for joining and sharing your insights. I know you're very busy and we appreciate you spending the time to sit down with us. Fernando, where can people sure. find you online if they want to get in touch with you? So email, social media, LinkedIn, give it to them. Uh, I think email, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of a technology neophyte and I don't, I don't do any social media. I know that our company has like a LinkedIn site, but I don't know how to access it or anything. So uh, <laughs> email me at fdeleon at leoncapitalgroup.com um, and uh, I'm happy to to, to talk anytime. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thanks everyone who tuned in today. If you enjoyed this episode, do not miss the next one. Visit go.crexi.com backslash podcast and sign up to get the next episode delivered straight to your inbox. Of course, you can always subscribe to the Crexi podcast on your favorite podcast app and check out our YouTube channel for video recordings of each episode. Take care and be sure to tune in next time.